Well, let me ask you, have you ever been really, really thirsty? I'm not just talking you were a little parched, but I'm talking like you felt like you were going to die from being thirsty. Anybody ever that happened before? So one of the thirstiest I have ever been was back when I was still in the army. We were at Fort Hood. So any of you guys who went through the army and went to Fort Hood, you guys know just how hot it is there in August. We were doing land navigation, which is where you get points and you plot them using a bunch of army tools, none of them which are GPS. Um, and so you have to know how to do it. And then you just go walk for miles to hit these points. And I'm a moron. And it was just supposed to be an hour long exercise. Here's the problem. They put me with a fresh lieutenant who had only done it once in basic training. For those of you who've been in the military, you know you can't spell lost without LT. It was rough. You, some of you guys are a little bit slower than others. I heard the delayed response there. But man, it was rough. What should have taken an hour turned into an eight-hour thing of us being lost. Here's the hard part. Because I was the senior officer, my job wasn't to fix the issue. My job was to try to get the younger officer on the right path. Hour number two, we were okay. By the time we hit hour number four and we hadn't even hit our second checkpoint, the chaplain was not feeling very chaplainly. I was so mad and frustrated and I was thirsty. And the LT, he didn't have any water either. Finally, after seven, almost eight hours, we got to the finish line. But you know, it wasn't at the finish line, water. We had an hour drive back to the containment area where we were sleeping, and I finally got water. It was the best bottle of water I have ever drank in my life. And it was Dasani. You guys know how awful that water is. When I finally got the water, it was awesome. Water had never tasted better Matter of fact, I'd have probably drinking water out of a water hose that day if they'd have had one. But today, we're going to look at the story uh, about an army that found itself in a hot, dry place without water. Looking at the story, we learn what to do in the dry seasons of life. Now, I'm not talking about physical thirst. Quite often, I pray with people who say, well, I just don't feel God. I'm in a spiritual slump. I, I, I don't know what to do. Everything just doesn't feel right. They're spiritually dry. Listen, if you're in a dry time or, or you feel alone or if you don't have any answers to the questions that you desperately need answers for and you desperately need God's presence, today's message is for you. If you feel like you just can't break through or if you're struggling to feel God, then listen close. Today's message, the story is found in 2 Kings chapter 3. Joram, son of Ahab, became king of Israel and Samaria in the 18th year of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, and he reigned 12 years. He did evil things in the eyes of the Lord, but not as evil as his father and mother had done. He got rid of the sacred stone of Baal that his father had made. Nevertheless, he clung to the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, which had caused Israel to commit. He did not turn away from them. So King Joram was evil, but he was less evil than King Ahab. He did do away with the altar of Baal, but he wasn't willing to lead the nation to worship the one true God. Now Misha, king of Moab, raised sheep, and he had, a, had to supply the king of Israel with 100,000 with 100, lambs and with the wool 
of 100,000 rams. Now, that, that's an old debt that he's paying there. How many of you guys know 100,000 lambs and the, the wool of 100,000 rams is a lot of sheeps? Is that the right word? I think it's sheeps. Verse 5, is it just sheep singular? <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> Sheepses. Verse 5. But after Ahab died, the king of Moab rebelled against the king of Israel. So at the time, King Jerome set out from Samaria and mobilized all of Israel. He also sent this message to Jehoshaphat, king of Judah. He said, the king of Moab has rebelled against me. Will you go out and fight with me against Moab? I will go with you, said him. I am as you are. My people are your people. My horses are your horses. By what route shall we attack? And then he said the thing that makes the most sense through the desert of Edom. So the kings got together and they decided to form an alliance and declare war on Moab. They also made the decision to take an unlikely route through the desert. It would be a difficult, challenging march, but they wanted the tactical advantage against their enemies because no one would ever expect them to come through the desert. So the king of Israel set out with the king of Judah and the king of Edom. And after a roundabout march of seven days. That is never a good way to describe a trip. Roundabout. I don't know about you, but I prefer to go straight, direct, easy, or quick. Right? They started out with a good plan, but somehow they got lost in the desert. No doubt they had a young lieutenant leading them as well. They didn't have GPS to guide them. I don't know who was leading the march, but whoever he was, the dude was in deep trouble. Three armies walked around in circles. After a roundabout march, the army had no more water for themselves or for the animals with them. They marched for seven days. That's a pretty tough journey, especially in desert conditions. They had no water for themselves and no water for their animals. They were tired, they were out of water, and they were wandering around in circles in the desert. And, as I can imagine, they were probably beginning to fight amongst themselves. See, when they formed the alliance, they assumed that victory would be quick and easy. But what initially seemed like a great idea turned out to be a horrible idea. They had had a tremendous battle to fight, but they couldn't even figure out how to get to the battle. Have you ever been there? Have you ever looked around and wondered, how did I end up here? And and how will I ever survive? Have you ever thought, "I, I don't even remember where I am, let alone defeat the enemy? See, all the soldiers by this point had to be questioning their leaders. And had to be questioning their strategy, right? They're going, man, nice plan. Let's sneak up through the desert where they won't expect us, right? Real good idea, guys. Wonder if anyone thought about asking for directions before we started on this journey. Now, we don't know how long it took for them to realize they were lost, but eventually word got back to the king. The king of Israel exclaimed, what? Has the Lord called us three kings together only to hand us over to Moab? Now, that is a classic blame-shifting statement. Why? Because the Lord didn't call them together. They got together on their own. But since none of the kings wanted to take credit for the mess they were in, they transferred the blame to God. Now, you wouldn't do that, would you? How often do you make plans and then they fail and then you blame God? You start a relationship that doesn't line up with God's plan. And then when it goes wrong, you say, I don't understand. Why isn't God in this relationship? You make the decision to ignore God's instructions regarding your finances and you decide not to tithe. You don't give to help others. And then when financial trouble comes, you shift the blame to God and you say, how could God let this happen to me? You start a new business completely 
on your own plan. You don't pray. You don't seek God's will. And then when everything falls apart, you blame God. While your kids are growing up, you skip church if it's raining. You skip church if the weather's too nice. Or, or if there's something good on TV. Right? Then when they're students or young adults and not attending church, you shake your fist at God and you blame and are mad at the youth pastors. It's even a classic strategy for those who don't follow Jesus. They blame God when bad things happen in their life, ignoring the fact that they don't even pretend to follow his plan. See, people with no connection to God still ask, how can God let this happen to me? That's like buying a hamburger at McDonald's and when it's not cooked right, getting mad at the manager at Burger King. Jehoshaphat asked, is there no prophet of the Lord here that we may inquire of the Lord through him? Notice what they did. They waited until they couldn't figure out what to do and then they decided to ask God. Seems like it would have been a good idea to call on God sometime before they got in deep trouble. Reading the story, I wonder, why didn't they ask God which way to go in the first place? Why didn't they consult God before they got in trouble? Why don't you? Why don't you turn to God before you get in trouble? It's one of the major themes in the Old Testament. People decided to run off following their own plans and only turn to God when disaster struck. Time after time, God came through and sent his deliverance. Aren't you glad that God's like that? You have to think that God probably wanted to say to them, hey, great and mighty and smart kings, you're on your own. You got you here. You can figure out what to do next. Let me know how that works out for you. An officer of the king of Israel answered, Elisha, son of Shaphath, is here. He used to pour water on the hands of Elijah. Now, I love this introduction because not only did God honor Elisha for his commitment to follow Elijah, other people noticed it and honored him as well. See, Elisha was known by his willingness to serve and follow Elijah. It's interesting that the army was marching with a preacher. Now, that's not uncommon today for armies to have a chaplain with them, but they don't take the chaplain out to battle. The, the chaplain stays at the FOB, the forward operating base, and then ministers to the soldiers when they come back from battle. The Bible doesn't tell us why Elisha was there, but Elisha was with them all along, but the kings didn't reach out to him until the situation was desperate. Jehoshaphat said, the word of the Lord is with him. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat and the king of Edom went down to Elisha. Now, that is not how it's supposed to work. You were summoned to come into the presence of the king. And when they called you, you went. The king did not come to you. You went to them. And these three kings were apparently humbled enough at this point even though they had talked a big game. We don't know where Elisha was in the marching armies, but wherever he was, here came the king, surrounded by all of their guards and their servants. And it had to be quite a sight. Elisha said to the king of Israel, what do we have to do with each other? In other words, why are you here? Go to the other prophets of your father and the prophets of your mother. In other words, you chose to follow gods other than the one true God. Why are you asking me? Go ask your fancy prophets and see if they've got the answer. Go ask the prophets of Baal and see if they can rescue you. The king of Israel answered, no, because it was the Lord who called us three kings together to hand us over to Moab. To which I'm sure Elisha wanted to respond with, no, it was not the Lord. You got together on your own. The king of Israel was trying to manipulate Elisha into helping. Now that they were in trouble, once again, he gave God credit for their problems. And Elisha reacted a little bit. He didn't appreciate their attitude and he didn't appreciate the fact that they were blaming God. 
He said, as surely as the Lord Almighty lives, whom I serve, if I didn't have respect for the presence of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, I would not even look at you or notice you. Now, Elisha apparently had some measure of respect for Jehoshaphat, but he definitely wanted the other two kings to know exactly what he thought of them. Now, those were pretty strong words to say, but they were especially strong to say to a king because they were dangerous because they could be, Elisha could have been killed for it. But then Elisha shifted directions. He said, but now bring me a harpist. While the harpist was playing, the hand of the Lord came upon Elisha. There are several ways that God uses to talk to people. Right? He speaks through visions, dreams, his word, other people, and circumstances. In this case, while confronted with a difficult situation, Elisha called for a worship pastor. Elisha made the kings wait. You didn't do that. But Elisha was acknowledging a higher authority than merely three earthly kings. Elisha was going into the presence of the king of kings. And it was in this time of worship that the hand of the Lord came upon Elisha. I wonder, what were the kings thinking when Elisha was listening to the harpist play? I also wonder if they wondered like I do, where did the harpist come from? Right, when you go into battle, like maybe in the Old Testament times, you'd expect like a trumpeter or like drummers But who's welding a big harp going through the desert? Like, that's weird. But notice what Elisha did. He went into the presence of God, and he came out with the answer that he never could have made up on his own. He said, this is what the Lord says. Make the valley full of ditches, for this is what the Lord says. You will see neither wind nor rain, yet this valley will be filled with water, and your cattle and your animals will drink. This is an easy thing in the eyes of the Lord. What? I I would have loved to have known how the kings reacted. They humbled themselves. They let Elisha insult them. And they stood around while he had his quiet time. And, and, And the answer that Elisha came out with is something that makes absolutely no sense. Dig some ditches. And not only just dig uh, some ditches, dig a lot of ditches, right? And God's going to fill them with water. I can imagine the kings weren't very happy at this point. They didn't call Elisha for a ditch-digging answer. They called on God for a miraculous, instantaneous answer. They were tired and worn out and weary and exhausted and dehydrated. Their animals were dying. They wanted an instant answer, refreshing in a can, water from heaven, or a pool right now. They needed refreshing, but instead, Elisha told them to dig a ditch. Elisha was saying, somewhere in the distance, God is going to send a storm. You won't see rain, you won't hear the wind, but you'll experience the benefits. The valley is going to be filled with water. And knowing what we know from history in this kind of dry desert environment is a big rain would produce a flash flood that would very quickly move through the dry desert. Almost everything would be runoff. And Elisha told the kings to dig pits to catch water. And we'll find out why it's important that the storm was in the distance. But that's not all that Elisha said. He said, this thing is an easy thing in the eyes of the Lord. He will also hand Moab over to you. You will overthrow every fortified city and every major town. You will cut down every good tree, stop up all the springs... And ruin every good field with storms. Elisha said, bringing you water is an easy thing for God. He'll do it. But he's not just going to give you water to meet your temporary need. He's also going to take care of the real need. The ultimate need. You're going to have water, but you'll also win the battle. 
It isn't going to be a little victory. You are going to thoroughly rout your enemy. And now I get frustrated with the story. Because I want to know how the armies reacted when they were told to dig ditches in the desert. I'm new to Arkansas like three months. Digging in the Arkansas ground is different than digging in the Texas ground. There are rocks here. You dig like two inches and hit a big rock. Not even two? Yeah, no, that's true. What do you think the army felt? I guarantee you they had to think this is such a waste of time. We're better off going against the enemy while we've still got a little bit of strength. But that stupid preacher's got us digging ditches. (laughs) Any of you guys ever dug ditches in the military? Don't you wish your handle would have been this long? Instead, they give you a handle that's about here. And it ain't this big. And it folds in half. You carry it in your rucksack and then you unfold it and you hope that you locked it in place because otherwise you're going to smash your knuckles. But they were out digging ditches. If I was a soldier, I don't think I'd have been very happy. I think I'd have been like, you know what? These kings have lost their ever-loving mind. First off, this plan is crazy. We're already hot and tired. We're about to fall over. I'm still thirsty. Now they want us to dig ditches in the hot desert. We'd better off be searching for water than digging pits in the desert. I also want to know how many of them refused or or how the king phrased the instructions. But somehow the kings got everybody in on the idea and they started digging ditches and lots of ditches. As far as you could see, there were ditches all over the valley. It made no sense. There wasn't even a sound or a hint of rain. And now they were in the middle of a hot, dry desert digging ditches. Now, I want to pause the story right here. We'll get back to it. But I think there's some application here. What do you do when you don't know what to do? What do you do when you've run out of your resources and you can't see a way out? What do you do when you, and and where do you turn to in those dry desert times when you need refreshing? First, you've got to acknowledge your condition. As much as the kings didn't want to admit it, they told Elisha the truth. They were in trouble. There wasn't any water and the people were going to die. And we often miss this one. We, we don't want to admit when we're weak or when we're in need. That's human nature, right? When someone asks, how are you doing? You lie and you say fine regardless of if you're actually fine, right? How many of you guys lied and said fine this morning and you weren't fine? Don't raise your hand. I know some of you did, right? That's what we do. Hey, how are you doing? Fine. How was the food? Fine. How's your mom and them? Fine. Is everything going good with you? Fine. It doesn't even make sense sometimes. Why? Because we don't, want to re- we don't want to admit our real condition to others. And we definitely don't want to admit it to God. But the first step to finding refreshing is to admit you need it. Listen, we all have dry times in our lives and in our spiritual journeys. You've got to admit it. Second, when you're in a dry time and don't know what to do, Worship. Instead of seeking a ready-made solution, Elisha recognized that his source was God. Again, this is not human nature, right? When you are in a dry time or a difficult season of life, your first response is usually not worship, right? Your natural first response is to go looking for practical answers. See, you want to worship when everything's going well, when you're happy. But when things are going bad, you're wondering and you feel dry and you've got a tendency to stay home and draw the blinds and feel sorry for yourself. That always amazes me. It's when people are struggling the most that they skip church and stay home. It just doesn't make any sense to me. Don't do that. Don't give in to the dryness. Instead, worship. Worship is like a cool drink of water on a hot and dry day. You live and work in a world that is evil and manipulative and cruel and unkind. 
When you get to your quiet time or when we come into the auditorium together, you get to leave all that behind and worship God. His presence fills this place. We drink from his presence into our dry part souls. It's a joy to worship him. To which you say, well, pastor, I'm just not comfortable raising my hands in worship. Okay. You don't mind raising your hands whenever your team scores a touchdown or they win the World Series. Maybe you need to do something you're not comfortable with. See, if you could figure out how to worship, when you get in the presence of God, the dryness goes away. Because something happens in the presence of God. Listen, God's answer to your problem is found in his presence. When you seek his answer before you seek his presence, you're not going to find what you're looking for. That was a good point. I'm going to preach that again because y'all didn't hear it. When you seek his answer before you seek his presence, you're not going to find what you're looking for. But see, it's in his presence that you'll find everything you need. We want answers, right? Right? We want help, and we want it right now, but God may be telling you to dig a ditch. Don't walk out now. If you do, there's going to be confusion. I'm not talking about physically going home and digging pits in your front yard with shovels. Instead, I am talking about getting ready for God's presence, preparing yourself to respond to his refreshing All right, pastor, if that's what you're talking about, then how do I prepare for it? How do you dig a ditch? I'm glad you asked. First, repent from known sin. If there are things in your life that you know are wrong, repent. Not only do you repent, but then you quit it. Anybody here ever gone, God, forgive me for this thing that I did, and you feel really good, and then like two days later, you're doing the same dumb thing again, and you're like, God, here I am again. Lord, please forgive me. Anybody besides me ever done that? Stop it! Like, how dumb is that? If my kid touches the stove and burns his hand, and it's like, ow, it hurts. What's my response? Well, don't do that. And if they do it again, hey, did you not learn your lesson the first time? Stop it. You know what I want to look at you sometimes as pastor and say, hey, stupid, stop. But I'm not going to because I don't want to offend you. But some of you need to just stop it. Some of you are in the condition you're in because you won't stop the sin in your life. Some of you are more worried about looking at pornography on your phone than romancing your wife and you wonder why she hates you. Some of you are so bitter because you've let unforgiveness come in that no wonder nobody likes to be around you because you suck to be around. That was really harsh. I'm sorry, but it's truthful. Listen, you've let bitterness and anger rise up in you and nobody wants to be around you because bitterness and anger stinks. And you wonder why nobody wants to be around you. Maybe it's because you've got undealt with sin in your life. You wonder why you're still in a drought and in a desert and it's because you won't get right with God. Well, pastor, why are you harping on this? Because you can't get right in God's presence if you're not right with God first. You can't hear him speak to the small, quiet parts of your heart if your heart's full of sin. Second thing you do, get in an atmosphere of refreshing. Go to church. Listen to CDs. 
All right, teenagers, CDs were these things that used to have music on them. Listen, it just makes sense. If you want to experience God's presence and his refreshing, be where you know the water is flowing. Be at, the op- be at the altar every opportunity that there's an opportunity for prayer. Listen, don't let pride keep you away. Be where the water is flowing. There used to be an old hymn that talked about getting under the spout where the glory comes out. Some of you just need to get in the presence of God and begin to worship and set yourself in an atmosphere to receive what God has for you. Be where the water and the presence of God is flowing, where God is touching people and where they're expecting his refreshing. Listen, don't become obsessed with answers. Make your goal experiencing his presence. If you walk into my office, most of the time there's worship music playing. You wanna know why? Because I need to be in the presence of God. And there is something about worship that prepares the presence of God. Third thing you do is do what you know to do. Now, I know that sounds easy. But too often, we look for a great refreshing of God. But we're not willing to do a little something ourselves. Right? Right? How many of you guys have done that? You've prayed and asked God to do something for you, and then you just wait. God, help me find a job. God, I want to spend more time reading your word. No, you don't. Because if you did, you'd do something. When I met my wife, you want to know how she knew I liked her? Because I pursued her. And when we first got married, and even 15 years later, I still want to be in her presence. Because she's pretty. And I love her. And she brings out the best in me. But if I'm willing to do that with my wife... But I'm not willing to do that with God. There's something that's messed up. You got to be willing to do your part. Digging a ditch is work. So is having your daily quiet time. Digging a ditch is work and so is obeying the commands of Scripture. Digging a ditch is work, but so is handling relationships correctly with others and resolving conflict biblically. Listen, do what you know to do. Well, pastor, how do we know what to do? Read his word. It is humorous to me when people want God to pour out his refreshing, but they aren't willing to obey the basic commands of scripture. They want God to bless their finances and and rescue them from their financial condition, but they're not willing to tithe. They they, They want God to bless their relationships, but they aren't willing to wait until marriage to have sex. They want God to get them out of jams, but they're not willing to pray. Do what you know to do. Listen, you're gonna have involvement. Think about it. Why did God have the armies dig ditches? Couldn't God just have zapped a lake into existence? Of course God could, but he wanted them to be involved. Now let's get back to the story. The men dug ditches all day. The next morning at about the time for the offering, the sacrifice, there it was. Water flowing from the direction of Edom and the land was filled with water. Do you know what that means? The men dug ditches all day and nothing happened. Wouldn't you have loved to have been in their tents that night? How dare God not fill up the ditches as soon as we dug them? We're fools, right? We dug all day and all we got 
for our effort, was more tired and more thirsty. Elisha and those kings are crazy. And they had to wait all night long. The answer and the refreshing didn't immediately come immediately following their obedience. You're not going to like this, but if you need refreshing, be willing to wait. Waiting is a part of God's pattern. And sometimes waiting is setting you up for victory. Number five, you've got to receive the refreshing. Receive the refreshing that God has for you. Get ready for him to fill you with his presence and his joy. And, and now let's look at a tremendous bonus. The armies didn't know that God was going to use their water not only for refreshing, but also for their deliverance. They were focused on their immediate needs. They were thirsty, but God didn't forget the bigger need that they had a battle to fight. Now all the Moabites had heard that the king had come to fight against them. So every man, young and old, who could bear arms and was called up and stationed to the border. When they got up early in the morning, the sun was shining on the water. To the Moabites across the way, the water looked red like blood. That's blood, they said. Those kings must have fought and slaughtered each other. Now to plunder, now to the plunder, Moab. But when the Moabites came to the camp of Israel, the Israelites rose up and fought them until they fled. And the Israelites invaded the land and slaughtered the Moabites. When the Moabites got up in the morning, they had no idea that water would be there or even could be there. They didn't expect waters of refreshing in the desert. And I think this is a really important part of the story because it lets you know that the waters of refreshing weren't a coincidence. If the Moabites were used to seeing water in the desert, they wouldn't have thought it was blood. That was not a usual thing at all. There must have been an enormous amount of water. When the Moabites saw it, they said, that's blood. They must have killed each other. And they made a horrible tactical error. They left their fortified city. They ran across the desert to what they knew would be an easy victory. Instead, the Israelites defeated a huge enemy with an easy victory. See, when the Israelites concentrated on refreshing water instead of on their enemies, God took care of their enemies. See, we've got a tendency sometimes to focus on the problem to focus on the battle or to focus on our enemies. Instead, make your goal his presence. To which you say, well, pastor, you've been kind of tough on us this morning. If it's any consolation, it wasn't in my notes. But here's why. After 23 years of ministry, I watch people struggle with the dryness of seasons. We all get dry every now and then. There are times we don't feel God. We say dumb things like, well, I'm just not being fed by pastor's message. Did you know it's not my job to feed you everything you need to get through the week? My job is to challenge you and, and, and make you desire to look more like Jesus. And in that, it makes you want to spend time with him. It makes you want to get in his presence and begin to worship. Well, pastor, I don't like to sing. That's okay. Turn the worship on. And let it begin to speak to your heart. And then what will happen? You'll begin to sing because it's not about like what you like. It's about worshiping him. I want to pray for you today. Would you bow your heads?
I don't want anybody looking around because we're going to talk sin for a minute. And I don't want to embarrass you because God is not a God of condemnation. God is a God of conviction. And this morning, I want to give you an opportunity to get right. Maybe you have been experiencing a season of dryness. And you realize today as I'm talking about sin that you've got known sin in your life. And today you'd say, Pastor, would you just pray with me that I can give this thing up to God? If that's you. Would you just raise your hand? Nobody's looking around. It's just you, me, and God. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. There's hands all over the place. Yes. Yes. So, Lord, today we come to you. Lord, and we confess, God, the known sin that we've got in our lives. Lord, we know how ugly it is. And Lord, we want to stop it. But Lord, we have tried over and over again. Lord, and we continue to fail. And so Lord, I ask you this morning to do the thing that only you can do in their lives, Lord. And that as they step in to stop whatever it is, Lord, that you would meet them halfway and set them free from the bondage they're in. Lord, I pray this morning for all of us, Lord, that we would get into an atmosphere that'll help refresh us. Lord, when we're dry, when we're spiritually thirsty, Lord, I pray that you would help us. God, as we get into your presence, Lord, that we begin to feel your presence. Lord, and I pray you'd help us to receive the refreshing. Lord, no matter how long it takes, Lord, we want to be refreshed by you. Lord, we're grateful for you. In Jesus' name.